And we're back with our panel. Robin Wright is a joint fellow at the Wilson Center and the U.S. Institute of Peace and a contributor to The New Yorker. David Ignatius is a columnist for The Washington Post. Tavis Smiley is host of The Tavis Smiley Show on PBS. And CBS News political director John Dickerson is also here with us. Welcome to all. A lot to get to today because there's a lot of news. And so, David, let me start with you. Secretary of State John Kerry has just landed in the region. What must he accomplish? I see Secretary Kerry as having three umbrellas he, he's trying to create. The first is an Iraqi unity government that will shelter Iraq, bring Sunnis and Shia together, at least to some extent, and allow a pushback against ISIS. A second umbrella is to bring countries in the region in particular, if possible, Saudi Arabia and Iran, under the same umbrella so that the basic driver of this Sunni-Shia uh, war that's mm -hmm. that's ripping the Middle East apart uh, can can be reduced. And then the third umbrella would be some kind of international support. Kerry's going to have to go back to the United Nations Security Council at some point if he's got serious ideas for a way forward, so he'll have a mandate. And I think he's trying to do all three. Robin, is it Secretary Kerry's goal to convince Maliki to step down, and can he even do that? Well, that's a great challenge because uh, Prime Minister Maliki is now arguing that his ouster would amount to a success for ISIS, for the extremists. And that, that resonates among many of the Shiites in Iraq, and they are the largest sector of the population. Uh, there is um, a, a movement among some, including some of the key clerics, to try to get him out. The challenge really is in, in creating a new government. The last time Iraq went through an election, it took them nine months to form a new government. They broke a world record. Yeah. And they don't have that kind of time this, uh, this time. They also don't have 80,000 American troops inside Iraq to prop them up. They've got 300 military advisors. There's a, a, tr a tremendous urgency. And so uh, trying to get the Iraqis together and also to bring back Sunnis. How do you do that? We've seen already that moderate Sunnis are now siding with the extremists. They're so angered and alienated by the Maliki government. And so that's as big a challenge as trying to find uh, a, way, a political solution and a, and a new government. You know, I keep thinking about this, David, because this is the calculus that the president is making, which is that no airstrikes or military action until you get the political stuff done first in Maliki, because you don't want to prop up Maliki in some ways, but yet it could take so long to form a new government. Well, I think in truth, Nora, he's hoping that Iran will, will, will do this f for the United States, that Iran will do the d dirty work. There's some signs that the Iranians have gotten fed up with Maliki. I have a report out of Baghdad I can't confirm that says that Friday, uh, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the most powerful person in Iraq, uh, met with Maliki and dressed him down in front of his staff in a humiliating way, which people in Baghdad, who were reporting to me, said was a sign that the Iranians want Maliki out. Another sign is the sudden surge of the Mahdi army, which has strong connections to Tehran, which is in the streets. You know, that's as much an anti-Maliki force as anything else. Mm -hmm. Tavis, how big of a problem is this for President Obama? I mean, he ran mm -hmm. and campaigned and won election to the president saying, I'm going to end the war in Iraq. He ended the war in Iraq. And this is now what's happening in Iraq. I think it's a huge problem for him. Um, and he would do well to remember, um, a la John Kerry, that he was against this war before he was for it, mm -hmm. uh, particularly given what the options are on the table right now. But I think one of the things that's troubling for me, Nora, and I think troubling, I don't purport to speak for the American people, but as I travel the country and talk to everyday citizens, what's troubling about this is the schizophrenic nature of our U.S. foreign policy to begin with. I mean, David was just talking about Iran a moment ago. How interesting is it, how ironic is it, um, that just a few years ago, <laughs> Iran was part of that axis of evil, and now they may be our ally mm -hmm. with regard to Iraq. Uh, the president says that there is no military solution to this crisis, and we read on the front page of the Washington Post and New York Times every day what our military options are as they trial balloon, what the possibilities might be. I mean, the reality is that th th the policy is all over the map, and you can take that literally or figuratively, but I would close on this note. It, it, it's troubling for me, and I think, again, for the American people, and clearly politics is a part of all of these decisions, and that's sad, but to watch these neoconservative interventionists this week with this revisionist history about how we got in this mess, how we got mired in this in the first place, is troubling, beyond troubling to consider. I mean, the president clearly you know, has made mistakes uh, since he's been president on a number of foreign policy fronts. But to lay all of this at his feet and to forget how we got in this mess in the first place, as if the clock started this week on Iraq, is sickening.
You know, the public is also of two minds on this kind of thing if foreign policy makers are also a little bit uh, schizophrenic. I mean, on the one hand, the public likes what the president is doing. If you ask them, you know, do we, 52% uh, say we should, the United States should mind its own business. That's up from 30% in 2003. 51% uh, to 17 say we as a country are doing too much to solve the problems of other countries. So on the one hand, we're in a deeply isolationist mood. On the other hand, when you talk to people about America's posture in the world, they think the president is weak. They, they, his numbers on toughness have gotten worse as these foreign policy crises have escalated. And so people don't like to see the country look like it is at the mercy of other events. And so there's a kind of push and pull here. As you pointed out, I mean, there was a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll this week that said a majority of Americans think that the president can't lead. And some suggested, you know, his presidency was over. Do the polls really matter at this point? I mean, this is a president who has a foreign policy crisis, you know, who, who has got to uh, prevent a terrorist group who has designs on the United States and from in the Middle East is on the brink. Right. I think they matter. Certainly, the Democrats are trying to keep their jobs. But yeah. um, I think for the president, you know, this question of is his presidency over, I think he clearly feels the upper range of the constraints of a presidency right mm -hmm. now. Uh, we're in an election year. The presidential election has already started. Republicans are not in a great mood to work with him. But as you quite rightly point out, a foreign, and when foreign policy crises emerge, a president has a great deal of power. The presidency is not over at all. And I would just say on the domestic front, if Republicans win the Senate and then Republicans are in charge of all of Congress, they are going to have to show they can lead. And a president will either be able to make a deal with them or he will block whatever they're doing, which means he'll have quite a role to play. And, and if I could add to that right quick, polls matter, uh, although I'm not one who believes in all these polls, but polls, I think, matter uh, principally because he has to have the support of the American people on whatever decision he wants to make. So clearly at that level, they matter. But this is the same president who just a few weeks ago told us that income inequality was the defining issue of our time. I would remind us this morning of the words of Dr. King that war is the enemy of the poor. Here we are 50 years after LBJ's war on poverty about to make the same mistake. We declare one thing, but we do another thing. And the more money we pour down this drain, the less money we have to make the eradication of poverty in this country a priority. Yeah, and the fact is this would be the third war we would engage in Iraq in 25 years. In the first war, you had the Saudis, the Japanese, the Germans who paid the $80 billion tab. The next war cost is $1.7 trillion, and we still feel the, the drain on our treasury. And we don't have the same will, whether it's the financial will or the political will. And so the challenge for the Republicans, as much as the Democrats, is to figure out a strategy that actually will work. And there's a lot of talk. Uh, Rubio this morning talked about drone strikes. And the problem is, when you use air power, you can, you can kill fanatics, but you can't kill fanaticism. Mm -hmm. And so the alternative is diplomatic, and that is the long haul. And that's what makes it so difficult. Now, presidents and their second term traditionally get involved in foreign policy because that's the area in which they have the greatest ability to leave a legacy particularly as they get into that lame duck last two years. And this crisis has underscored the need uh, for the president to get even more deeply involved. But there are no easy options on this one, harder than the last two put together. Can we address sort of the criticism, though, that, the, that this is, that ISIS's growth is largely a result of the, of the president's failure to act in Syria or his inaction on a number of fronts? Is, that, is there any truth to that, David? How do you see that debate? I, I think there is some truth to it. I've said several times recently that big problems in life are not the ones that sneak up on you, but the ones that you see coming at you. And this has been coming at us clearly over, I mean, you, over two years. You just heard Mike Morell and Mike Rogers say this wasn't an intelligence failure. It, we've known about we, we, ISIS. We've known about it. It's, it's been a policy failure. The president has been given various options. Uh, to try to uh, fill these uh, vacuums mm -hmm. that exist. Um, the, the, the smartest thing that was said, I think, over this weekend was by our former ambassador, Ryan Crocker, in Baghdad, who said, yes, uh, with, with withdrawal uh, is, 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 is dangerous, but it, 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 that, that disengagement, leaving a vacuum, can be even more dangerous than intervention. And I think that's what we've seen in both Iraq and Syria. You know, with a vacuum, with a sectarian leadership in Iraq, that space was filled with really the worst, most dangerous people. And we're now have to, the president may not want to do a whack-a-mole strategy, but he's going to have to have some strategy because at the end of the day, that is 
a commander in chief's first job. But who do you support? I mean, that's the problem. Well, the, the, there, there are, are many attractive options in either Syria yeah. or Iraq. There, there are Sunni tribal leaders who are, I promise you, because I've met with them, are begging the United States for help in standing up against these people. These people scare them almost as much as they scare us. But is there another potential prime minister waiting in the wings to replace Maliki, who has the support of some Sunnis? Well, well, I think we heard Ahmed Chalabi's name mentioned this week. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a viable candidate because yeah. he, after all, was the one who pushed the hardest to have the Sunnis and the former ruling, ruling Ba'ath Party eliminated from the process. I think there are some names out there, uh, and I think there will be a lot of d serious discussion about that over the next few weeks. Uh, but you have to basically Sunnify Iraq again in order to prevent the country from falling apart. You've already seen the Kurds basically moving out on their own. They've taken the oil-rich center at Kirkuk. They've deployed their forces along that border. And once the the, the Kurds kind of, whether it's de facto or formally, mm -hmm. kind of say, protect themselves, then you have uh, real mm -hmm. questions about preserving the other two-thirds of Iraq. But it's their Iraq. decision to make, though, Nora, not ours. And yeah. we make the mistake all the time of trying to put people where we think they belong. All right. We'll be right back.